Welcome, Daniel. It's a pleasure to have uh, the, the person that has trained me, that has uh, been my mentor and uh, my colleague for almost 30 years. So it's a pleasure to have you here on this call. And uh, I, I, first of all, I'd like to ask you to introduce yourself and then uh, I would like to get into a couple of questions about the situation, the crisis as it's going. So, so please uh, uh, introduce yourself. Well, my name is Dan Takini, and um, you can blame me for Davide. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. There you go. No, I am. Uh, it's an honor to work with you, David. I'm. I'm a an executive uh, consultant, coach, uh, transformationalist. There's a number of words. But my, I'm usually. I'm a change. I do a lot of work with change and implementation, uh, restructuring of companies, uh, working through crisis. Anytime they want to implement something new, um, I, I've done a lot of work in the corporate world and in the social service world, and. Um, and so my work is around working with teams, dealing with change, um, working with individuals, dealing with conflict, working through the conflict so that the conflict can deepen the relationship and further the project rather than stop it and uh, foil it or frustrate it. Right. So basically, uh, there's no time as this time for change. I mean, we're talking about this crisis that is changing the whole world. And uh, we don't actually know yet what's going to happen. But uh, we, we have a feeling that things are not going to be again the way they were before this COVID-19. So uh, first of all, please, uh, you know, you, you've been involved with business. You are involved with businesses that are going through this, you know, just to give us uh, some kind of overview of what's the experience, what's the feeling around, what's going on for, for the business around. Well, I, I think first off, I think when something like this occurs, there's a disorientation because it's, inter, it's you know, it's interrupting all of, all of our patterns, all of our, all of our habits, and so it tends to trigger the the survival mechanisms in us. You know, we we become afraid and we get disoriented, and we tend to react at first, and our reactions are all oriented to what we're used to, or trying to get it back to what we're used to, and it's a form of resistance that makes it even worse. You know, the more you resist it, the worse it gets. It's like, you know, when you're riding a bike, you say, well, you know, I'm, I'm not going to hit that pole. I'm not going to hit that pole. I'm, and then you hit the pole because that's what you're looking at. You And the bike goes to where you're looking, right? And so that's initially, I think, what's happened for people. And then, <clears throat> you know, it's an interesting thing, but there are some blind spots that we tend to, to go through and the first neurologically you know our brain is wired and I'm, a lot of my background a lot of my study is in neuroscience and pretty much i'm, I'm looking like i'm not a scientist but i'm a, i'm a plumber i'm the guy that wants to like how can i use this to help myself and others navigate a change navigate the changing waters that they're in and and actually produce what they what's really value what's most valuable to them and one of the first things, you know, the brain is really uh, unique. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a pretty remarkable machine, but it's, it's interesting because we have five senses and they all fire off at different times. That's what gives us an idea of what's going on around us. So it's really interesting. We feel first. It's, it's about, I think, 0.75 or 7.5 milliseconds we feel and then we think. And, uh, and the information from each of our senses, from our listening, from our smell, from our taste, our feeling, et cetera, reach our brain at different times. And so we're constantly putting that together and having to synthesize that information. And it produces, uh, if, if it's not familiar, we go into uh, survival, you know, fight, flight, follow, fool or freeze. We go into kind of this automatic reaction. And um, in fear, in a state of fear, we release these, these uh, chemicals like cortisol and catecholamines and other other chemicals that close down our prefrontal cortex, which is what allows us to think, kind of move outside of, you know, above from what's happening to us and think about it. And that shuts down so that when we feel threatened and we move into a protective stance, right? And, and when we do that, we're literally just machines reacting or automatically acting. And, and it tends to um, complicate what we want to get done. We, you know, we want to get one thing done, but we're, while we're trying to protect ourselves at the same time, we're, our attention gets off of what we need to get done. And we end up protecting ourselves, which produces a whole different effect with the team, 
and with other people and, and what we want to get done with them. And ten, it tends to send them into fear as well because they recognize that I'm protecting and now they can be afraid because they know when somebody goes protective, it could mean at their expense. Right. So, so, so that's, that's kind of interesting because, you know, for me also, you know, when you go into a reactive mode, you know, things, uh, you know, you tend to protect yourself. And when that starts and everybody does that around, that becomes quite a difficult situation to manage because everybody's thinking about their own loss and their own uh, fear concern. And, and so now what, what would you say it's best to do in that moment? You know, what would you say it's like uh, something practical that we're, you know, because in these calls, I like to give some, uh, some tips about, you know, because fear is something that, you know, in Italy, we're yeah. talking about fear. So it's like everybody, oh. everybody's afraid of everybody. You know, now I was, I was outside, you know, going to get the water and I saw people waiting with the car, like 20 meters behind me until I was finished uh, to get there. So, you know, there's a lot of, a uh, lot of that going on. What would you say would be a good way to interrupt that survival mode and and get into intentional mode I don't know what you call it but you know some well, some mode that will be fruitful useful or... yeah I, I call it a, a resourceful mode right like how can I take advantage of utilize benefit myself and others from the circumstances and situations that we find ourselves in and I think you got that the set there's some blind spots that I, I that are biological that I think we we're somewhat aware of, but we have to become, you know, aware of, we got to catch them before they take us or they, before they, we have to get them before they get us, if you will, contain them before they contain us. Or, you know, and the first one is, and, and again, these are scientifically proven. I can, you know, there's a lot of research on this, but the first one is that we tend to see the world. We think the way that we see the world, everybody sees the world that way. So if somebody's doing something, like you're walking across the street, the people in the car are stopping. Thinking, what are you doing outside of a car? Maybe they're upset that you're outside of a car and they're going to stay far back because the way they see the world is you ought not be outside the car or whatever, you know. And, and so we tend to pull back and we think, what's wrong with that person? They're doing something silly. And the, and, uh, the guys, we look at each other and go, oh, that doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense from our point of view but we tend to project our point of view onto others. And so rather than be curious, we become um, judgmental. <clears throat> judgmental or, you know, punitive or dogmatic. Because dogmatic is, I'm not open to your point of view. Your point of view, you, you doesn't make sense because it doesn't fit with the way I see the world. And of course, you must be seeing the world like I do. So there's no openness. And um, to catch that, to get curious about that, to notice, Wow, you know, when, when, you, when I start to elevate, because you're going to elevate, again, you're going to react quicker than, <clears throat> than you're going to think. But the minute you, the, the reaction can be actually a stimulus where you can catch it and go, wait a minute, there must be something here I need to pay attention to. There might be something I do, I'm not aware of. Right. And, and, and just simply inquiring and understanding other people where they're at can help uh, in communicating, even if somebody's doing something that looks dangerous, if you want to communicate with them in a way to see that it's dangerous, then you best be able to understand. And they need if they get that you are connected to what they're up to or you're interested in them, then that reduces the level of fear, which reduces the level of survival, opens up a, a clearing or a possibility for us to connect about something and put our heads together which we're much better with our heads together than right. when we're facing off with each other. Now, now one thing, one thing that uh, I get out of what you're saying is that, you know, reaction will, will start by itself. Now we have a, a moment to kind of elevate ourselves while we're reacting and, and interrupt that reaction and substitute that with curiosity with, you know, instead of, instead of fear, being curious about what's going on rather than judge it uh, beforehand to protect self. Is that what you're yeah. talking about? Yeah. It's really interesting. The studies on, when people change their frame of mind, when they get curious, you actually, like, if you're really angry, try this sometime. If you're really angry, if you're married, you know what I mean. And if you're living together over weeks of time in one building, right, and you're, you know, got a small space where you're trying to navigate and you find yourself getting irritated, et cetera, the next time you find yourself upset with somebody, somebody get curious about why you're upset and the curious and, and what's going on for them. The curiosity will actually intervene in the anger and and reaction 
because the nervous system can't hold two states at once. So when you start to get curious about it, it changes the biochemistry in you and, and opens up, it, it calms it down, right? Now, you might want to just sometimes, for instance, you might just want to stop and get alone because and just let yourself calm down. But as you get curious about your upset, you will tend to calm down faster, which will open up a new way of, a new possibility. You'll actually start to consider other ways you could approach things, other th meanings that the person might have other than the one you put on it, right? You know, it's interesting you touch on it because in Italy, uh, in, at this point, it seems like, uh, um, I, I don't know you call it English, but domestic violence, you know, it's increasing yeah. to, through the roof, you know, because people are confined with each other, you know, they cannot leave. And so they uh, tend to be violent to, towards one another. I mean, I'm not saying everybody, but there's that type of, that type of reaction is much more common these days of the lockdown than it was uh, before. So if people that before were not even getting close to violence because they the way to get out and distract themselves now they're confined inside and there's a lot of more of uh, domestic violence you know that's, well, yeah, that's one of the reactions you know it's, you know it's like a vicious cycle right you start getting mad and the more you indulge the anger the more it escalates and you know then of course that can break to the level where you're gonna you know could get violent if you indulge yourself that far right um and you know we all know how how volatile relationships can be yeah, yeah. you know and it's and the and the, the but the thing is, if you start getting curious, if you do take the time to let your chemistry settle down and you do consider other meanings, you know, it's really interesting. Another principle is the meaning of any communication is always in the listener, right? If you think about that, when you say something to me, what it means to me is what I put on it. Not, and it may not even be close to what your meaning. Uh, and we've all had this experience where we hear somebody say something, we, you know, I've jumped to a meaning and maybe even gotten upset or angry only to find out that the person is trying to compliment me or trying to, you know, give me something. And I'm, I'm feeling like they're condescending. You know, the, I, yet, yesterday we, we live on a 11 acre farm, you know, it's a, and, and there's this, an older woman, she's older, she's only 13 years older than me, she's 77. And, and, you know, she's older and she works real hard in the yard. She's a farmer. And, you know, we went over, we, we, we made some food here. And, you know, you know, Davide, we, we go give food to people because they're, they're neighbors, right? So my wife wanted to go bring her some soup that we made. And she got insulted because she can do it on her own. She doesn't need anybody's help rather than receive it as a gift. And it opened up a really interesting conversation that brought us a much closer together because we wanted her to know that, oh, okay, no offense. We didn't mean that in our culture, the way we think that's we're showing affection. We're showing appreciation that opened her up quite a bit. And, and, you know, and she didn't take the soup, which we could understand in her own view, but she didn't get, she kind of dropped the offense. Right. Right. Right, right, but but I but going back to her and having that conversation was you know I like geez we're really sorry we want you know we didn't mean to you know yeah. to upset you and this is what we were thinking and please forgive us well that opened up a whole intimate conversation right but at first it was kind of hurtful like oh wow ouch mm -hmm. right? no, but it's a, it's interesting like uh, a lot of times at least in what I see that offense is more in the in the person that gets offended rather than the intention of the offender you know obviously there are people that are offenders and they intentionally offend but most of the times you know people don't mean to offend but the yeah. other side gets offended anyway so the point is that the offense is more in the in the person that receives than in the person that uh, probably yeah. is trying to make a gesture of uh, affection or whatever you know well i'll, I'll never forget uh, you know one time my my daughter got uh, expelled from school and and uh I was upset with her. You know, I was talking to her, what happened? And I was kind of elevating and like that. And the phone rang while I was ever elevating. I pick it up and it's the principal of the school. And immediately I'm, oh, hello, you know, Mr. So-and-so. Uh, yes, oh yes, I, uh, Elizabeth came home. We've got, and I'm just in completely different mood. I hang up the phone and I go back. <laughs> and my daughter goes, how come you're so nice to them and, you can, and you're still mad at me? And, and, and I realized I was, I can control that when I want to. Right. And that's what I really started realizing. And maybe I, and as I calmed down and listened to her, I understood why she got expelled and actually wanted to talk to the teacher and the principal because she was 
asking questions that she actually asked a, a, a biology teacher not to state their political views during class because it had nothing to do with the process and it was bothering her. And, and they released her from school. So then I, I wasn't as mad because I understood what she was up to, right? And maybe worked with her on ways to talk and when to talk and the right timing, et cetera. You know, and, and she was real open to it. Uh, but when I was yelling at her, she was completely cr crossed because I wasn't hearing her, right? And then when she brought my attention to the fact that I could break that state in order to get my way with the with the principal, why couldn't I do that with her just to hear her was a great point, right? And yeah, I think I mean, if we what, one, of the things, one of the things that, you know, because I'm trying to follow and, and think about my own experience and uh, sometimes I rather, you know, lash out because that really gives me some <laughs> kind of satisfaction rather than be curious, you know, Wait. I just really want to be upset, you know, it's just like, you know, there's, there's, <laughs> there's a way to let go of that, that anger. You, you know? and I have, you, we've had those discussions, you and I, we've been in those on our van rides across Italy, you know, arguing and, right but you know there's i mean look we get a we get a reward for being right if i'm right about something i the brain delivers a dopamine hit and that feels good i mean think about it when you're right you feel you get a you get a reward so we're unconsciously uh because we're unconsciously rewarded for being right which equates in survival staying alive. If you're wrong out in the wilderness, you make the wrong decision, you eat the wrong mushroom, you go down the wrong path, you could be eaten or you could be poisoned or who knows what can happen. So being right is like this, your body goes, good, you're gonna stay alive, this was right, right? And so in a relationship when we're talking, which often requires just the opposite of the survivor sk survival skills where you're gonna make yourself vulnerable to the other person, being right, becomes more and more important because you're so vulnerable in the relationship right so what you're saying is like uh, is like in relationship you sometimes you have to be counterintuitive you have to do something that doesn't come spontaneously because if you do what comes spontaneously you think about your survival when you do something for the other it's intentional because you have to interrupt reaction and start to act basically and you're focused outside of yourself which which, which can the more we focus on something outside of ourselves, which takes some trust to do, because you have to take energy you would take off yourself to protect yourself and give it to something outside of you. But the more you do that, the closer you move towards entering what they call a flow state, right? Which is where you're, you're so much focused, you, your brain starts to shut down the, some of the, the neocortex where time is spent is located. And so time just passes. You ever have that feeling where you go, you might work four or five hours without even getting up, right? And then you realize you thought you worked an hour or a half hour and you look up, it's been four or five hours. Yeah. Uh, or, and you've forgotten, you're not even thinking about your own needs. So the part of your brain that gives you the idea of being separate from things, it all shuts down, they discovered, so that the energy in the brain can stay focused on what you're looking at. Mm -hmm. and, and actually the brain is 500% more effective at processing information in a state of trust. And that's what basically the flow state is like a state of trust where you're completely focused on what you're doing. And so all the energy that would normally be spent in being aware of time and where you are and if you're safe disappears and you're completely focused on what you're doing. So another, another way to say it is, the, is that um, concern distracts us from our focus basically. Self-concern, yes, survival, our fear of not getting what we want, looking good, not looking good, our fear of not feeling good, of being out of control or being wrong, pulls us away from the situation and the people in it into just protecting ourselves and we lose our creativity. Wow. Wow. So um, um, I see we're getting towards the end of this call, and, and I'm, I'm just getting into this conversation. I don't even look at the time, but you know, one thing I would I would like for you because you know people here in Italy are in a lockdown, and, and even there they're beginning to be in a lockdown. What would you say just to to help them use you know what they're going through at this point in time? Just what, what would be your tip for people just to to say you know uh, we're there, and what can we do with it? Well. <clears throat> I mean, for me, I, it really works for me to pay attention to who I'm talking to and what I want to get done with them. You know, like, what do I want to have happen with them? What experience do I want to have with them? And I pay attention to my reactions because I really can't control them. 
but I can control my reactions so that I can hear them, so that I can accomplish connecting with them rather than just protecting myself. And I, I don't know how much people, you know, meditation, when you say meditation, to me, that's the value of it. I do it every morning. I do it in the evening before I go to bed. And during the day, I often stop and just consider how I'm feeling and what the conversation is in my head that would put me in a place to either be in despair or, you know, like, what's going on and just recognizing, not that it's bad, just, and I think nine tenths of the battle is just recognizing it and then wondering about it. And I find that that becomes really useful. Yeah. Uh, I don't, I, you know, and then I'm much better with other people when I connect with them, even if I'm not in a good mood or even if I'm not feeling well physically, I'm much better at being with them. Right. Right. Now this is, this is very valuable. I think because, you know, we're all in uh confinement with other people you know hopefully and and to be with other people you know the practice you're talking about is really valuable because if you concentrate on your need they will look like they're an obstacle to your need but if you look at them as you know a possibility to grow together in the process of lockdown that then turns into a valuable time that will actually help us in the moment where we're going to go out and not knowing what we'll find but at least we're a team that uh, consolidated uh, during the time of lockdown yeah. Well, you know, <laughs> exactly. You know, and your brain's constantly looking for coherency, right? So if what you see and what you hear doesn't match up with what you think should be going on, you're going to be disturbed. And that disturbance is valuable. It, it, what we tend to want to do is just change things so that they look right or that we can, so we can feel better rather than wonder what's going on. What is it I'm missing? What might I need to hear that I'm not willing to hear that could help me connect with, understand, um, offer something of value to somebody else, right? That's and right. you, rather than try to change them and correct them so that my world, so I feel better. I, I wonder what I could learn from them that might broaden my understanding of our relationship. You know, that's great. And, and uh, you know, I believe this conversation could go on forever. But, you know, I'd like to, uh, to interrupt it here. But, you know, with the request that we might go back to it, you know, in a few, in a couple of weeks sure. or something like that, just to look at the, the situation evolved, you know, and, and how the, the, the story evolves. So thank you, Dan, for being with, with us today. And uh, we'll talk soon. Thank you, Davide. Always a pleasure.